Ladies and gentlemen, special guest, as promised, he's back. The host of Quote the Raven. You know what I'm saying? All my, all my people that like to talk about economics and money, and we're going to go in on that Lady Janet Yellen. We're, t- we're talking crypto. <laughs> we're talking concerts. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have Chris Irons in the building. What's up, man? Hello. I paused for applause, but I didn't hear yeah. any. Oh, no, no, no. Trust me. Everyone's going to clap in their car, bro. People on a treadmill <laughs> clapping right now. No, nobody should be clapping for me. I didn't, have the, I good, didn't have the button like queued up for you. What's that? I didn't have the applause button queued up for you, but sorry. Go ahead. That was like the introduction that sounded like it was about to. Ladies right and gentlemen. That. Yeah. It was about sorry. to explode. What concert are you going to, by the way? Oh, I'm going to see Genesis tonight in Philadelphia. Oh, nice, man. Uh, yeah, not my idea, but, you know, one of my best friends is a uh, stoner and way into music. And so he's assuring me that it's going to be a magical experience. So I'm like, all right, cool. Bro, I'll Phil go. Collins, bro. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. Phil Collins is doing it right. Phil- he made me go see this other stupid Genesis cover band that was like the old Genesis back when Peter, Peter Gabriel was oh. in it. And, you know, they like had all these like weird like props on stage and everything. And it's just like, man, I must not be high enough for this. But I can I I like Phil Collins. So I'm Phil excited about motherfucking it. Collins. <laughs> uh, first of all, the hip hop community has a, a very, very soft spot in their heart for Phil motherfucking Collins. Do they? Oh, yeah. That I can feel it coming. <laughs> like every every urban radio station hip hop mix show would mix in um, that song. Oh, that's so funny, dude. Yeah. So ever so, since ever since Mike Tyson and the Hangover. Yep, true, totally. That's, that song just had its rebirth right there. Hell yeah, man. Well, have fun tonight. Uh, thanks for joining us. Well, let's get your blood Happy pressure up before you go to the concert. Oh, uh, let's do it. I'm stoked, man. <laughs> that's what's up, brother. Um, so the last time you were here was February. Yep. Um, how how would you assess the the economy then versus now well it's uh it's different i mean if you want to talk about the economy or you want to talk about the stock market i mean those are two completely different things um the economy is in the midst of i guess you know what most keynesians would say is is a slight recovery because a lot of people that had lost jobs throughout the course of the pandemic are returning to work Um, Not enough of them, though. You may have noticed the entire country is going through a massive labor shortage right now. Uh, Part of that is due to the fact that the government has subsidized unemployment and has been handing away free money for the last 18 months. And so businesses are having a very difficult time enticing people to come back to work because if given the choice between taking a fucking bong rip and playing Xbox on your couch and getting $600 a week for doing nothing and going to work at a Wendy's where, you know, the people driving up to the drive through window are pissed off already to begin with and you got to serve them your fucking chicken nuggets for $15 an hour, the choice is very clear. Um, with that being said, we're, you know, we're kind of trickling back into the right direction. But as you've noticed over the last year, inflation has gotten out of hand severely, um, which is also a product of the government's uh, genius idea of slapping four to five trillion dollars on the Fed's balance sheet and rolling all that money off the Fed printing press. Uh, And so what that is doing in conjunction uh, with there being a labor shortage and a supply shortage pretty much everywhere because you know the, the the supply chains are completely fucked and there's no truck drivers there's no you know there the uh, the ports of los angeles and uh i forget what the other major port is in california uh, long you know, beach. they can't long beach right they can't agree to work 24 hour days and so um at the same time now you have inflation which is essentially brutalizing the middle class and the lower class inflation is um you know when prices rise like that and people's wages don't rise commensurate with them to meet the increase in what their cost of living is uh people's quality of life has to decrease they have to buy less stuff they have to buy you know shittier stuff um and so we've been enduring that over the last year if you want to talk about the stock market instead of the economy, because they are two completely separate things, the only thing that the stock market relies on uh, and really the only driving force behind which way the stock market goes is what the Federal Reserve plans on doing in terms of whether or not it will continue to stimulate the economy or not. 
Right now, the Fed is, you know, implemented quantitative easing on a massive scale back in March of 2020 to respond to COVID. And uh, now we're seeing the first indications that they may try to taper some of their asset purchases and essentially consider the idea of rate hikes, which is really the first thing you would do to try and slow inflation down. Uh, they're considering that. And so you're seeing some volatility here in the, in the stock market over the last couple of weeks. As a result of that, the, you know, the stock market used to concern itself with how earnings were doing at companies, what macroeconomic data looked like. Now, really, the only thing the stock market moves on is whether or not the Fed continues to stimulate the economy or not. And that's what the market is trying to figure out right now. So you mentioned uh, Keynesian, I guess the Keynesian economics. Could you expand on on what that is? Is that just like printing more money? Yeah, so there's like there's two general schools of like economic thought, right? One is uh, uh, Austrian school, which essentially preaches that, <clears throat> you know, savings uh, is a virtue. Uh, you know, savings is what provides you with capital investment in order to help, you know, entrepreneurs start businesses that the uh, rate of interest in the market, which is essentially the cost of borrowing money should be set by the market, meaning it should be set by the amount of supply of money that is out there to be lent and the demand for people that want to borrow money. Um, and, you know, the Keynesian school advocates, and this is a loose definition, advocates more for uh spending. Uh, they, they judge the economy by how much money is currently being spent, regardless of what your balance sheet looks like, which is why we have a country that's $28 trillion in debt, yet we still focus on spending and the amount of consistent, you know, it's like this hamster wheel, the, the Keynesian system, right, where you just have to keep spending and spending and spending and you have to keep looking at jobs at all costs. But whatever you do, don't look at the balance sheet. Don't look at how much debt we're accruing to do that. Um, and the Keynesian system kind of advocates uh, that spending is the virtue and that, you know, the market rate of interest should be determined by the central bank, mm. uh, which is what happens when you hear the Fed is, you know, raising or lowering interest rates um, and essentially more that the economy needs to be uh, micromanaged. Um, and so what we've what we're seeing now, what our economy and our stock market are now are products of a uh, global macroeconomic system that has been. Uh, micromanaged by central banks and politicians and essentially the elites uh, globally. If you were to strip away all of that nonsense and jargon and bullshit that comes with Keynesian economics and you just wanted the uh, markets and the global economies to rest on the natural laws of economics, things like supply and demand, right? The blocking and tackling of, of economics, free markets, uh, you know, capitalism, lower regulations, lower taxes, um, then you would see a completely different uh, economy and completely different uh, global, um, you know, capital markets than you do now. Uh, and so the, the difference between the two is essentially, you know, the Austrian school is more conservative economic thought, more old school. You know, your Friedrich Hayek, uh, your Friedman, those types of guys, uh, and your your Peter Schiff. Um, and your Keynesian school is your, you know, your Paul Krugman's, your modern monetary theory people, uh, the people that go on MSNBC and argue that, you know, we can inflate away the debt, that we can pay off our debt by taking on more debt. Um, and so it's this big argument about whether or not the, you know, the system we're in now is doing more harm than good in the sense that it might be blowing up an enormous bubble every time we have a recovery and we do something to stimulate the economy instead of taking the medicine and allowing the economy and the market to correct the way that it needs to, the way that it's begging to, um, that if we paper over that, like we did in March of 2020, is that eventually going to do more harm than good? And that's like the, the conflict between the two schools of economic thought. The Keynesians will tell you in a situation, uh, you know, like March 2020, where we shut the whole country down, Keynesians will tell you that, oh, we did the right thing because we essentially papered over the entire economy by printing four trillion dollars, putting it on the Fed's balance sheet and, you know, essentially changed the tire of the vehicle of the economy as it was traveling down the highway at 90 miles an hour, uh, you know, and kind of allowed the car to keep moving, despite the fact that, you know, it doesn't have the uh, the uh, the regulation size tire on it anymore. And the Austrian school would say, hey, if you shut down the country, 
uh, of course, fucking economic data is going to look like shit. And of course, the country is going to go into recession because you're closing all these businesses and you're telling people to fucking stay home. And so the market needs to absorb the reality of that situation. And markets do need to crash and they do need to come lower because that 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 wipes out malinvestment. It wipes out, you know, uh, bad behavior. And and so and then eventually from there, they would argue that the recovery uh, from taking the medicine, enduring the pain would be a healthier recovery than the one that we've kind of put in place here um, that many people, myself included, will will advocate for the idea that this is eventually going to do more harm than good. We are we're relying on printing dollars. Mm -hmm. That's essentially it. We're not bringing enough in in tax revenue in the country to pay for all of the bullshit that we want to spend money on, uh, whether it's social services, you know, all of our spending, the spending that we need to do to keep the country acting as though it's open, even though it's closed. That costs a fuckload of money, yeah. right? So that money has to come from somewhere. And if it's not coming from taxes, we have to print it. And if we're printing dollars, the supply of dollars expands. And ostensibly, fucking old school people like me will say that eventually that's going to wear away at the value of the dollar. And that's going to be a negative. So far, that hasn't happened in any catastrophic sense yet because the dollar is the reserve currency globally. But people like me would argue, hey, we're on an unprecedented path. And we don't know what the outcome is going to be. So instead of being arrogant and saying, hey, we can just rely on fucking essentially like game genieing the, the entire economy by printing money. Maybe we should step the fuck back and, you know, not let our hubris get the best of us here and approach this modestly. And so what's happened now is the Fed has painted itself into a corner. On one hand, the. Keynesian response to March 2020 is creating insane amounts of inflation, right? We're seeing just in the official numbers, which are completely understated, and that's a whole other discussion. Just in the official numbers, the cost of living is going to rise close to 10% this year for the average American. That means if you're not earning 10% more in dollars, your quality of life is diminishing. The you know essentially what the difference is between what your raise in earnings is and what the raise in your cost of living is right, so it has to deal with that because that's now becoming an enormous issue on both sides of the political spectrum. It's out there. It's in the mainstream media. So and uh, so uh, uh -huh. it can't raise rates though, right? Raising rates is how you would fight inflation because when you raise interest rates, it takes dollars out of the supply, it forces people to put dollars in the bank because they they can get a yield from then like saving again. So it encourages saving. It discourages speculation in like the stock market and in risk assets. And that's normally like when Paul Volcker was Fed chair and he had to raise rates to 20 percent. That's how you would fight inflation. We can't do that because as a nation, we wouldn't be able to service our national debt. If we raise the interest rate on our national debt, we can barely service it now. So when you look at like our budget annually, we pay something like, I don't know, maybe a trillion dollars, maybe eight hundred billion dollars just in interest on the national debt. So now we are, you know, fuck tangled in this like box where we can't really get out in either direction, um, you know, and the Keynesians will say, all right, well, we can figure out a way we can print our way out of it, you know, somehow and things aren't completely fucked yet. This is why you see MSNBC saying, well, the inflation's a good thing. It's like, bitch, your president is out there complaining about fucking high oil prices. Like, obviously, it's not great in the oil market, right? Meanwhile, this fucking genius, okay, the president of the United States, is out there complaining about the price of oil with one hand, and with the other hand, he's signing fucking uh, you know legislation that's shutting down oil pipelines in the United States, and he's wondering why prices are going up. It's like numb nuts, supply and demand, economics one hundred and one, right? Like fifth grade education math. That's all you need for that. And and then so, anyways, uh, that's the general gist of yeah. uh, the Austrians versus the Keynesians. <laughs> great, uh, great explanation of everything. Yeah, no. <laughs> A great explanation yeah. of it all. Thank you. Yeah, no, we appreciate that. Uh, absolutely. Because I've heard the term like Keynesian economics. Also, modern monetary theory, which you... That's like Keynesian economics on crack, right? M Keynesian economics. And Keynes gets kind of a bad rap because a lot of the dumbass shit that, <clears throat> you know, very far left progressives are doing now, Keynes himself didn't actually advocate for. 
Um, so that, you know, Keynes kind of gets a little bit of a bad rap, but Keynesianism has morphed into what's called modern monetary theory. Modern monetary theory is essentially the idea that we can just rely on a on the printing press. We can rely on printing as many dollars as we want to fund whatever the fuck we want. And that is somehow going to lead us to some type of utopia like the rest of the world, like Weimar Germany, uh, what Weimar Germany, uh, which dealt with, you know, a huge inflationary crisis. Uh, you know, like these people hadn't figured it out yet. Right. Like, like these academics are, you know, like Paul Krugman, some genius to just figure out like, Oh, well we can do this. You know, we can, we can fund everything we want by printing as many dollars as possible. And that, of course, begs obvious logical fallacies like why do we even pay taxes if we can just print as much money as possible? Why does the U.S. need to bring in $3 trillion in tax receipts if we can just print it, right? If we can just print money to make our way to prosperity, why not just print $10 million for every American and just hand it to them? And the obvious reason is because that would pornographically increase the amount of money in the supply. It would drive inflation through the roof, you know, what you want as a nation is productivity, mm-hmm. right? You want a nation that has a large bank account that holds tangible reserves, you know, of something like gold to back up the fiat currency that they have and a nation that produces stuff, right? So, like, you think about a nation like a business, right? If you were running a business, would you want your business to have an unmanageable amount of debt and not produce anything and not be able to sell anything? No, You know, and so our country, we don't produce anything here. We just all we do is export U.S. dollars to China Mm -hmm. and they send all their shit here. Mm -hmm. Right. And so the country is in this extremely precarious position where if for some reason people lose confidence in the U.S. dollar, we're completely fucked because we don't make anything here. And then inflation just runs rampant. It runs completely out of control. And so that's the general gist of things. Uh, You know, modern monetary theory is the idea that we don't need to produce anything. The only thing we need to produce is dollars. And printing money doesn't generate productivity, doesn't contribute to the nation's productivity. It's just pure inflation. Like the GDP and stuff like that? Yeah, printing money doesn't, doesn't, you know, unless, unless the Fed uses that money to buy government bonds and then the government takes that money, which is essentially how QE works, right? The Fed prints a shitload of money. And then it buys treasury bonds from the government because the Fed and the treasury, right? The Fed is the central bank and the treasury is the government entity are supposed to be two completely different things. And so this end around, you know, kind of fucky little trickery that they do is the Fed will print the money and then it will ship it to the fucking U.S. Treasury in exchange for treasury bonds, which is an obligation to pay that money back in the future, right? It's a bond. You're just selling a bond. And so then the government can take that money and spend it on government programs, whatever they want. And those types of things can increase GDP, but it needs to be done in a way where the productive increase is not offset by the amount of inflation. And, you know, in order for that to occur, the capital needs to be allocated extremely wisely and government is terrible at allocating capital because they don't have a profit motive so there's no there's no motivation for them there's no behavioral incentive for them to allocate the money uh, in a way that isn't wasteful, in a way that generates the maximum amount of efficiency, the maximum amount of productivity. The Fed would be better off giving that money to the private sector, you know, because at least a business, wants to keep costs low, they want to keep quality high, they want to keep the customer happy, and they want people to come back and continue to return to them for business. The government doesn't care. It's fucking free money in one door, and they can just hand it out however the fuck they want, and there's no consequences for you know fraud, abuse, uh, malinvestment, and things like that. So literally, you know, printing money and sending it to the government in an attempt to increase GDP – uh, is the worst possible way to try and do that in the country. It's a wonder we made it to 2021, right? <laughs> it really is, dude. This should have the been halted 10 years ago. The problem is most people don't understand. The problem is most people don't understand this stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, like when you, when I try to reason with people who are on the left 
And look, I'm not on the left about, I mean, I'm not on the right about everything. You know, I'm really, I consider myself a libertarian. I'm socially very, uh, uh, very liberal. You know what I mean? I, you know, I like to smoke weed. I like to drink. I'm all for however people want to live their lives as long as they're not infringing on the rights of others. Um, you know, I try to walk a line of common sense. Um, and what I find when I talk about this to people is they don't understand it. And, you know, it's people on the left and on the right, you know, because why would somebody that's a plumber who's out there fucking like actually one of the last few producing anything in this country and contributing and helping and providing a service that helps people, you know, like what the fuck time do they have to sit around and try to figure all this shit out? This is a system that is purposely cloaked in jargon for the purpose of the common folk not being able to figure it out. Mm -hmm. You know, 99 out of 100 people that you'd walk up to on the street are not going to be able to explain to you what I just explained to you yet. It's really not that difficult of a concept. You know, it's just cloaked in a lot of bullshit. It's cloaked in a lot of jargon. And I would be, I would not be surprised if the, you know, the line of common sense that we all want to walk together is, is closer than we all think. The problem is that people come in with these logical fallacies or they argue, you know, one part of a of a of a nuanced point instead of looking at the broader picture, um, you know, looking at it under the umbrella of, all right, well, you know, what do you want for our country? Like, do you want what's best for us? Do you want what's best for us as a nation? I mean, are you a globalist? Do you think that we shouldn't have nations? Do you think that we shouldn't have states? Do you, you know, do you think free market capitalism is a virtue? Like, I'd like to talk to you about why people don't understand. You know, socialists are a great example because the idea of socialism sounds wonderful. It sounds great. You know, you don't have to work. Everybody can just sit around and fucking, you know, equality for everybody. Yay. Mm. You know, but it's like in reality, you cannot do that because your quality of life will suffer meaningfully. And you have all these idiots on college campuses and all these you know campus marxists and, oh. you know that <laughs> oh, think that man. they're going to be able and i said this on your last podcast they think they're going to be able to walk around with their fucking iPhones and their Starbucks cups and live in a marxist system and it's like bitch capitalism provided you with the quality of life you have now yeah okay with the uggs that you're wearing on your feet with the fucking jeans that you're wearing with the food that's in your cabinet with the house that you and your parents live in that your parents probably worked for and you probably didn't do shit for like capitalism provided all of that and quality of life i have this blog called fringe finance and i wrote an article uh, about what I call the quality of life con, because it's this thing that nobody pays attention to. It's not really a easily quantifiable measure for most people. So people can argue points and ignore kind of that their quality of life would suffer. They could say, hey, well, we would just all get together and it would all be about equality and you know, we don't, it doesn't need doesn't need to be about corporations, man. Meanwhile, they go home and they order their Christmas gifts on Amazon. It's like you stupid fucks. Like, take a look at what you're doing. You know, like, do, do you not want and just ask anybody that grew up in a socialist nation? That's all you need to do. That's all you need to do. Yeah. You know, ask somebody from Venezuela, ask somebody from Cuba. You know, why did you come to the United States? And this we talked about on. I don't want to repeat what we talked about on the last podcast, but this is why Trump won fucking Miami-Dade County when nobody nobody thought that he would. It was because you had all these immigrants that came to the United States because they know that free market capitalism, that hard work wins mm -hmm. in this country. Yeah. And these motherfuckers were ready to work. You had rugged fucking individuals coming to the U.S. ready to fucking do whatever, pick bananas, fucking mop floors do whatever for minimum wage saying I'll work two motherfucking jobs. If I have to, I will put it together. I'll buy the Ford truck. I'll get myself an apartment. I'll send money back home. You know what I mean? That's because that attitude is what won Miami Dade for Trump because they came from socialism and they know how fucked up of a system it is. And they know it always results in people getting killed. It results 
in a terrible state planned economy and it results in lines for bread and food and nobody wants to end up there. So uh, yeah. the campus Marxists can mm-hmm. fucking put that in their pipe and smoke that shit right now. Yeah. And then a lot of these immigrant families, they, they come to the U S they work hard, they get the Ford F-150, they get the apartment, they send the money home, they save up, they send the kids to college, the kids get brainwashed. Now they're fucking Marxists. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes, right. Especially in the Mexican community. So real quick, man. Um, could you could you break down to the listeners the policies and the different economic approaches from what we've seen? Obviously, I mean, the Biden regime, they've only had a year. And of course, you know, it, it's apples and oranges in a way, right? It feels like a, his whole presidency already in a year. It feels like it's been three years. So so like, for example, you got Peter Navarro and the, the economic team that Trump had. Like, what is the compare and contrast of their approach? Well, you know, there were a lot of criticisms about um the way Trump ran the economy, too, that I had. And so let's get those uh, out right away. First and foremost, Trump campaigned on the idea that we were in a bubble. He campaigned and was critical of the job that Janet Yellen was doing as Fed chair, claiming that she was leading us down this road to this big fat bubble, which I agreed with at the time. But then when he got in office, he didn't advocate for hawkish monetary policy because he knew that it would crash the markets. So he let Janet Yellen keep going down the dovish path that she was on. And instead, he bragged every day that the stock market was going up. That was a little fucked up. So that's my biggest criticism of Trump was, you know, he ran on one thing and he did another. What I will give Trump credit for is Trump understands that we cannot have these massive trade deficits anymore. You know, if there was one thing that he advocated for, it was producing more things in the United States. And he took a hawkish, serious tone with China, which I think is extremely important. Don't want to rehash everything we talked about last time. But the difference really between the, you know, and generally this is the Democrats between the Republicans, uh, the difference between the Republicans and the Democrats. Republicans are generally hawkish on China. They realize China probably really isn't uh, our friend. And Democrats want to, you know, welcome them with open yeah. arms. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so, you know, we all oh, we can be yeah. friends. The whole globe mm-hmm. can be friends. Look, a lot of great people from China. I have friends that are Chinese nationals, you know, wonderful people love them. But the Chinese government, you know. They're bad motherfuckers Mm -hmm. like they you know, they are not fucking they are not stupid. They are not naive. They are fucking rugged. They are tough. And the Chinese people are, too, you know. And so technologically, China is kind of blowing past us on the technology highway. I think from a business perspective, they're far more shrewd than we are. And what's going to happen is if China hoards all the gold, which will be used to eventually back their currency in the future, their digital currency, in my opinion. Uh, And they produce everything there. What do we have? Yeah, they control our supply chain. What do we have? Yeah, they become the center. Right, exactly. And so, and I mean, you're seeing this issue with, you know, everything being backed up at ports. I mean, we're having a crisis where when I go to uh, Quick Check yesterday to get a coffee, I can't get a large cup because they're out of large cups, right? Among all the other shit you can't get now. Well, why is it? Well, it's because the shipment didn't come in. Well, where's the shipment come from? I don't know, but it comes from a fucking boat somewhere, you know? We don't make anything here. We don't make shit here. So if the shit doesn't come over on a fucking boat somewhere, we're not getting it. And, like, we're starting to see a little bit of that, that now. And meanwhile, you got columnists out there for the Washington Post writing shit like, oh, you know, we just need to... We just need to sit back and take it, you know, like we've we've gotten too comfortable as Americans. It's like, no, this is indicative of a much larger problem. OK, there is a huge problem here. And that problem is we don't make anything in the United States of America anymore. We don't make shit. You know, we make some cars in Detroit. GM and Ford have a couple of factories left here. We make a few things, yeah. um, you know, and that's why this whole notion of. <laughs> People that say, oh, I buy American, you know, and they those people get laughed at. They go, oh, you buy American? Like, oh, OK. Yeah, you know? that, that that's a campaign uh, we would like to do. 
um, put out there, like start priming the audience and promoting it, making it cool. Like, hey, this Christmas, buy American. Our buy last American. episode, dude, was all about, it literally made in America. We just, it somehow turned into a whole episode about why we should buy American, how to, you know, make more things. Listen, I don't know if you listen to Jocko on Rogan, Chris, by chance. Yeah, of course. It was fantastic. And that's what kind of spawned, like we just, it started off with one thing he said in our entire last hour <laughs> the other day was all about making things here, buying things here, promoting things here and supporting things here. Yeah. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, you know, that attitude gets tied in with a lot of, you know, just general dumbasses. You know, you got a lot of fucking like dickheads in the South. And I lived in the South off and on for a little while. Hey, man, we're in the South. You know, brother. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right. That are that are down South. that are like, man, you know, I buy American, you know, yeah. fuck these whatever, you yeah. know, racial slur here yeah. or whatever. Like, Brown it's person. Just like, <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, 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 exactly. You know, and, and it's not like that. You know, it, it's not you can't like uh, you can't. You can't like, um, you know, the, you have to separate the identity, the real reason why people should produce and purchase things that are American here from that dumbass attitude. Right. There's a real reason that we need to produce things here. It's because if we don't, the country is going to get caught with its pants down. We've already gotten caught like that. We're twenty eight trillion dollars in debt. We can't even make the interest payments on the debt. The cost of living is skyrocketing for everybody. We have a nationwide labor shortage. We have a nationwide product and service shortage. I mean, I wrote a piece on my blog like last month called America's Turning Into a Third World Country. I mean, it is. You go to San Francisco, the shops are fucking boarded up. Shit's closed. Things are closed down. I mean, the, the change I saw in some U.S. cities in America just from prior to COVID to now has been stunning. Um, and we're heading down a very, very bad path, a troubling path, in my opinion. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I don't know. T tell them the name of your question? tell them the name of your blog one more time, please. The name of my blog is called Fringe Finance. It's uh, quote the Raven Q U O T H T H E R A V E N quote the Raven dot subset substack dot com and fringe um, finance it's called fringe finance yeah you glossed over it twice you're actually the first substack like i hear a lot of people that on other podcasts that are have all moved to substack and are writing on there and yours is the first one i actually went and followed and i'm, I'm keeping up with and that's like that oh, platform's nice. new because i like listening to stuff it takes a lot for me to sit down and actually read something but the way that you do your podcast and the way that you talk is i think the way chingo and i talk and podcast and it's it's like it's made for the layman like i don't mean that to be an insult anyway like it's made sure. in a way that it's easy to digest and feel like you could have a beer with you and talk about what you're talking about Hey, I just, well, I'm not doing it because I want to be Mr. Fucking Finance Guy. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not, I didn't grow up being like, oh, I want to put on a bow tie. <laughs> I want to give a fucking lecture about economics. You know, like, uh, that was never my goal. Uh, I'm doing it because as I personally found out about the system around every corner, I kept being like, uh, what the you fuck? know, like, holy shit. Like, this is how it works. Like, holy shit. And then the more you learn about it, the more you realize, like, wow, like, we're really kind of in uncharted waters here and i gotta tell you you know i grew up in a household where both of my parents worked very diligently they came from modest means uh you know they my mom went to community college my dad uh you know i think took a couple of credits at community college but really they both you know they worked on their high school education that was it uh they came from modest means they were able to build a life for themselves and for i mean my dad was a letter carrier for the post office and my mom was an administrative assistant uh at the local municipal library and they built a life for me you know from that just from hard work yeah right yeah. just from saving their money and just from hard work so those were the principles that i was raised on and so to see how the global economic system is run it stands at odds with the way that i was raised and so it's just kind of in the fiber of my being and i can't help but feel like if other people understood it that we might be able to affect some kind of positive change um, and people would be just as stunned as I am. And so, you know, I do it because it's a little cathartic for me. It's nice that I can do it and I can, you know, get an income from it, which is fantastic, you know, because at the end of the day, I have to pay my bills and that's cool too. But really, I, you know, I didn't start it to do that. I never like charged. Even now, my podcast is free. I have a Patreon. You can, people sign up if they want to, but I don't do like, you know, Patreon only stuff i just you know hope for the good of the cause people that maybe they just like it and same with my sub stack i mean i take a lot of time to write on my sub stack but i do publish some free content on there too um but i think you know the message is 
more important than yeah. You know, I find myself on my Substack un unlocking my posts every time something happens, and then putting it out there on Twitter and saying, you know, I, I took this out of the paywall because I think it's more important here yeah. what I'm saying mm-hmm. than it is to like get paid fucking you know three dollars to read this. So just fucking read it and take the message. Um, and so that's really why I do it. I you know I think I think if people like you guys, you know, you're dialed in. You guys, like, we need more fucking people like you guys. We're definitely we trying. More people. What were you going to say, Jingo? So you gave me an idea. So check this out, Chris. Uh, Rob was complimenting your ability to communicate in layman's terms and, and make the shit make the shit sexy. You know, talking about economy. You know what I mean? Break it down for a motherfucker. You know, hey, check this out, bro. So look, here's here's an idea for a segment. We're going to do like some man on the street shit, right? So we, we're in a gentrified neighborhood. That means okay. that around the corner, you still got the little corner store where the homies hang out. All yeah. day in the front, and I don't want to say there's a illegal activity. I have one of those too. Right here. <laughs> Perfect. You can see it from the window. So, so we want to drop off Chris, maybe hidden camera, maybe mic in the hand, and you know, show the tattoos, bro. You got to show the tattoos, uh-huh. and then just be like, "Hey, man, check this out, bro. You familiar with a uh, modern monetary theory? Oh man, what the fuck is that? Man, check this out, man. Picture this: the globe, you know, globalist. It's like a giant trap. Now, now the CCP, that's like the new the new dealer in town. Now they stepping on your toes. <laughs> You know, I would love to see that in a perfect world. But I have those conversations. <laughs> you know, when I go to the bar, I mean, I, I drink at working class bars. You know, I drink Paps Blue Ribbon and Heaven Hill whiskey. Right? And, so and like, break down some economics. I'm not, I'm not sitting with the socialites sipping martinis on the 19th floor of the Bellevue, right? Like, I'm at the fucking corner shithole drinking. By the jukebox, you know, by the pool table and shit. Hell yeah. Yeah, and so every once in a while, I'll be sitting there, you know, just in a t-shirt and shorts, and somebody will come up to me and be like, what do you do? I said, I'm a financial analyst. They're like, you don't look like one. I said, I know. Can you fucking believe it? You know? <laughs> and so I had those interactions. People say like, well, what do you think about? Yeah. What do you think about Keynesian. crypto or something? You know, and then I'll go off on a thing and they'll be like, holy shit. You know, I never thought of it that way. Hey, so on subject, off subject, you mentioned uh, briefly the what you've witnessed, the decline, like third world fucking activity, like San Francisco, like crime and shit. Did you see the interaction between uh, Seth Rogen versus uh, Casey Neistat on Twitter? No. So just to set you up, you can you can uh, approach it how you want. But um, Casey Neistat tweeted like, hey, man, someone broke into my car. They stole my kids' decorations. L.A. has turned into a crime-ridden third world country, a uh, city. And right. Seth Rogen on that weed, he chimes in. He's like, dude, I never see my car as an extension of myself. And uh, dude, it's called living in a big city. Sometimes he's like, my car has been broken into over a dozen times. Sometimes they leave in a knife or they'll leave something and consider it a treat. So what have you seen, bro? Like when you go to other cities and you see the crime, how do you take it? What a fucking dope. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like what an idiot. Like here, just take my whole wallet. You know, like I'm not using it. (laughs) I'm a fucking idiot. You know, it's like, like, look, either you accept that in a civilized society, people should be operating within the rule of law or not. You know, if you're Seth Rogen and you're like, oh, yeah, I don't mind my car getting broken into. It's like, bitch, if you had fucking no money. And that was your 1998 Civic hatchback with the fucking tailpipe little coffee can that you put on there with your last $99. And you had your last $12 in the fucking glove compartment and everything that you owned in the back of that hatchback because you were in between apartments and somebody broke into it and stole your shit. You would be fucking pissed. You know what I mean? So, I mean, that's just bullshit. You either accept that you can either be a doormat for people that want to do the wrong thing, or you can stand up to them and do the virtuous thing, which is encourage a civilized society where people abide by the laws, which is what we all try to do on a, you know, on a normal. And, you know, we do the little things. I was on South street yesterday, right? Little old lady trying to get on the bus on South street with a whole thing of groceries, right? Fucking 15 people standing there looking at her, you know, trying to get bags up to the, you know, up the, up the steps to the, uh, to the septa bus, you know, and I'm looking at these people. I'm like, none of you fucks are going to go help this lady. Right. So I ran across the street and helped her. You can do stuff like that, you know, or you can, or you can sit around like Seth Rogen in your fucking mansion and talk about how, okay, well, you know, just, uh, yo man, uh, everybody should have, yeah. you know, it's okay. It's not an takes, extension of myself. more than I do. It's like, yeah. all right. I'm like, you know, I'm- you wouldn't say that shit if that was your only car. If you were broke though. Yeah. I wanted to tweet like, you know, who else doesn't believe in personal property? Communist, you fucking comrade. Yeah, so, so check well, this. It's true. Check this out, Chris. I was in Salt Lake. Hollywood, listen, man. Hollywood doesn't understand 
anything. You know what Hollywood is? Okay, Hollywood's a bunch of people that have lived in bubbles their whole life. All right, and look, I love movies. I love the arts. I love music. I love actors. I love musicians. I love actresses. I love comedians. I like Mark, Mark Ruffalo. Mo- <laughs> Most How dare you. of Hollywood is people that have lived in bubbles. Now, I don't want to offend anybody, but you say, what do you mean, Chris? Lived in bubbles, right? Everybody knew when you went to high school or you went to college, the fucking theater people were just a little different. Yeah. You know what I mean? That the people that did theater were in their <laughs> own fucking world, you know, going to Renaissance fairs and shit and like doing all kinds of. Hey, take know, it like, easy on hey, Chingo. He yeah. was in this bubble just two years ago. What hey, are you talking it, about? Dude, I good. love the Ren Fest. <laughs> It's all good, man, but you know I'm not lying. Dude, my whole family dresses up for RenFest, Chris. You you know I'm not lying, though. But that doesn't matter. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I encourage that. If that's what you want to do. But you can't say that those people that fucking dress up, it's like Civil War reenactment. You know what I mean? Like, Part of those people. Hey, Rob right? Lowe. Yeah, what the fuck are you talking weekend. about, man? That's my activity. <laughs> Part Kidding. of those people's fucking heads are not down here in reality. And that's okay. That's okay. Right. But Hollywood and people that are, you know, in the arts and that are actors and actresses are coddled in a certain way and live in a certain world that may not represent the reality of a man such as yourself, such as the people at the corner store, such yeah. as myself that used to wash dishes, such as my dad that used to deliver fucking mail for a living. It may not represent that same reality. And then these people wind up striking it rich, right? And they, because they become, you know, an incredible actor and they do a great job at a movie and they get popular and that's great. And I love them and I want them to be successful. But then once they have achieved success and have achieved fame because you know maybe they're good looking or maybe they're a great actor or maybe they're funny whatever then they feel like they can turn around and start to for the first time ever without any clue what they're talking about george lopez start <laughs> opining on the ideologies that make the world go round. shots right? fired and like taylor swift is gonna have figured something out about marxism that fucking the rest of the world hasn't figured out Give me a fucking Oh, yeah, break, yeah, yeah. Billy, right? yeah, Billie me, Eilish. Billie Eilish. Yeah, I mean, who was it? LeBron James that was reading, like, the Communist Manifesto. In oh, the my room. They got some God. picture of him reading the Communist oh Manifesto God. in the locker room. Oh, my it's God. It's like, you it's, you know, somebody Bro. put up a, a a photo of all of the photos of him reading books, and he's, like, on page one. It's on the same page. I reference this, too, dude. Yeah. It's so yeah. funny. It, it's no secret. Bron, Bron, don't like to read. So, hey, Chris, I was in Salt Lake City recently. I don't know if you've ever been. But um, my well, my perspective of Salt Lake was Mormons, Utah, hyper conservative, like ultra conservative. Beautiful. Right? Yeah. So, yeah, of course, outdoorsy. So recently uh, I was down there doing a gig. So I'm in the downtown area where a lot of the yuppie tech people have moved in. You got these uh, overpriced condos and stuff. And you see tons of homeless people. You see the cops looking overwhelmed, looking for someone who like took a, sh- took a sh- dump somewhere on a sidewalk. And then you see like the, I don't know what it was, Lutheran church of some sort. It had a big BLM flag on it and it had the big uh, trans rainbow flag on it. Across the street, we wanted coffee. We went into this one place. It was called the People's Coffee. The logo is Karl Marx. So I was just like, what (laughs) happened to Salt Lake? And this is happening uh, in a lot of cities. I mean, we live in a Democrat run city, you know, Houston, Texas, fourth largest, third largest. And uh, do we see the crime going up? I'm trying to escape cities dude i couldn't believe that it was really Karl marx's logo too or his face literally as a logo literally there's a there's a bookstore on south street here in philly called like the anarchist bookstore or some shit oh. and they got a big sign out front that says you know acap all cops are bastards oh. Oh, and wow. i'm just like yo I'm not you know one day you're gonna be looking for police help and they're not gonna want to help you and, and them bastards ain't gonna, gonna be there <laughs> you know what i mean and i just you know, I walk past it all the time because it's near a bar that I like to go to. And every time I walk past it, it's always got some other dumbass shit in the window like that. And I'm look, I'm all for whatever ideology you want to support. OK, big believer in the First Amendment, big believer in their right to say that. 
big believer yeah. in their right to sit around and fucking, you know, play with their ironic looking mustaches and, you know, smoke their natural American spirits out front and fucking, you know, listen to Mineral or Pedro the Lion or whatever's trendy this week and talk about how the whole system has repressed them their whole lives. You know, they're fine. They're more within their they're well within their rights to do that. But it's just like, ah, I keep thinking every time I walk past it. Like what happens when somebody breaks into that fucking place and they got to call the cops and the cops show up and they see a big sign up front that's like, fuck the police, you know, and they always have some like they go out of their way to be dicks with like signs like that in the front of their building. And every time I walk past, I'm like, I would never fucking shop there. You know what I mean? Like there's going to be a guy that looks just like Chris Irons throwing a cinder block through the window. (laughs) No, that's what I was just saying before. I would never do anything like that. (laughs) Allegedly. Uh, Yo, man, we'd love to come uh, visit Philly at some, at some point. And uh, maybe we can have, yeah, what are you doing tonight? Yeah. (laughs) Right. Speaking of though, Genesis concert. Yeah. Chico made a broad of a good point about leaving the city. Chris, uh, I want to try to cram a couple of points here before we wrap it up. But one is, what do you think of, the cities versus leaving and escaping those hell holes? Well, it's tough. You know, I think that the nation is going to have to come to terms with the fact that democratic leadership isn't necessarily the best thing for cities. I mean, what are the problems in cities right now? The problems are that um, there's civil unrest, there's crime, there's riots, there is, you know, general mayhem and what's happening is and there's egregious taxation that's the other thing that's why you know corporations are leaving new york for florida in pennsylvania now we have you know a a soda tax in philly you know you should have heard some of my friends that were bar owners fucking talking about what the soda tax is going to do to them you know democrats don't realize that you can tax people so much that eventually they leave Look at what happened in California. You know, you guys are in Texas. Everybody's defecting to Texas. You know why? It's not because the ocean looks better from Texas. It's because there's less regulation and there's lower taxes and more freedom. Right. And so Democrat run cities and they're just making dumbasses of themselves. Like, look at Lori Lightfoot in Chicago, who was like advocating for defunding the police. Then the whole city fucking went up in flames. Their murder rate is like completely out of control. Now she's got to, you know, walk back and saying, oh, I never said defund the police, you know, and that now she's I read an article the other day. She's like scrambling to try to find twenty one million dollars somewhere in the budget to like refund the police. It's like dumbasses. Like maybe if you stopped and like address the complexities of these things, and thought about them, you know, so these these policies, high taxes, you know, saying crime is OK. New York, like we're not going to prosecute turnstile jumpers anymore. It's like, why are the trains free now? It's like, no, well, it's just, uh, you know, it doesn't doesn't make sense to put them through the judicial system. It's like maybe you should fix the judicial system. So it does make sense so that when somebody breaks the law, they fucking wind up getting in trouble for it. Otherwise, there's no behavioral incentive for them to not break the law anymore. Meanwhile, the MTA is broke. And that dildo that's the mayor of New York City is scrambling to try to find money, you know, to help the MTA. It's like, why don't you just make people pay the fucking subway fare? It's like this big, you know. It's like a fucking dog chasing its tail, just way more tragic, and it just never ends. You know, people are going to have to come to terms with the fact that if you want cities to bring people in, you have to lower taxes. You have to be able to promise that there is going to be law and order in cities. That's most Americans. All they want to do is wake up, love their family, love their kids, go to work, have a drink, enjoy their holidays, and try to spend their 70 or 80 years here on Earth you know, in a peaceful state, not fucking stepping on anybody's toes and just abiding by the law. That's what most people want. If you can't provide that, you know, if somebody's looking at a place to live and the uh, Walgreens next door is getting looted on a routine basis and the district attorney has come out and said, well, we're not going to prosecute shoplifters anymore. It's like that was San Francisco. Like the district attorney came out and said, we're not going to we're not going to prosecute shoplifters. So what happened? People started shoplifting a lot. And then Walgreens, you know, they, Walgreens started closing down stores. Yeah. 
And then so Walgreens is like, fuck this. We're out of here. And now there's no Walgreens in San Francisco. And the rest of the businesses are going to do the same thing. So I don't know how many empty buildings these dumbass politicians are going to have to fucking look at to realize, oh, I fucked up. There's nothing here. You know, like maybe one day they're going to, well, I want a Snickers bar. You know, there, there's no 7-Elevens anymore. I don't know what to do. You know, like how many times, like what is it going to take to bludgeon these people in the face and get them to realize that these policies are failing, right? And so all U.S. cities that are run by Democrats, <laughs> which most of them are, New York, Philadelphia, Houston. Chicago, mm. San Francisco, I'm sure there's more of them, I think Atlanta also too, you know, they're all going to have to realize that it's the policies that are the problem. Meanwhile, in Philly, we got people claiming, you know, racism, it's racist, you know, it's there's an, there's an inequality problem. It's like the fucking police chief in Philly is a black woman. <laughs> like, you know, I mean, this is like when the people on MSNBC, when when Larry Elder was running for governor of California, called him the black face of white supremacy. That was some 1984 like, shit right there. It's like you stupid motherfuckers. Like, do you have any idea how dumb you look when you publish a headline like that? Larry Elder from South Central L.A.? But Nor the black yeah. radio host? Normie's he's bought the, it. He, oh, yeah. He's the face of white supremacy? Like, give me a fucking break. Why? Because he's successful? Because he made something of himself? Because he articulates well? Because he's a lawyer? Because he thinks for himself? Because, Republican. you know, give me. Yeah, exactly. It's only because he's a Republican. That's it. Yeah, they made it. They made it. OK. They somehow justified it in his George Orwell method. They justified a, a white lady with a monkey mask throwing an egg on the black guy running for governor at him. Yeah. yeah no, and they that turned was crazy. Right. They turned it into, well, she's a white ally. And then he's the black face of white supremacy. <laughs> so ridiculous. Yo, man, that was a, a hell of an answer. Hell of an ending. Uh, we're going to have to make that a clip for sure. Before yeah, I, I can't do. I can't get you out of here, though. I you're gonna have to cram this answer into something that's it's uh, within your time uh, it's frame cool. here. I have time. All I right. have time. Good. Good. I gotta get your opinions on crypto. So, it, in, let me say this also: if we do rehash some things from February, it's fine because the audience is literally five times as big as it was in February. So, sure. and I want people to listen to Quote oh, the Raven. Cool. Yeah, yeah. You know, ch people finally stopped throwing arrows at Chingo and realized that, that he was right about a lot of things from... Uh, they saw we were building back broke. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I want to listen to Quote the Raven and, and subscribe to your Substack. But I do want to get your, your, in your input on crypto because I... Let me just say, like 10 years ago, I bought like $5 worth of crypto, and now I have like a couple hundred dollars. I was like, oh, that's interesting. And then it went down this new rabbit hole, and I had a relative and other friends that are into it. So I started going down the rabbit hole of YouTube channels and articles and shit about this. And then I listened to your most recent episode just the other day, and you had that famous trader on there, and you guys were talking about crypto. And I listened to Adam Curry, you know, podfather of the RSS feed and all that. He's all about like Bitcoin maximalist is what he calls himself. So there's a lot of conflicting uh, approaches to this, but... What's your take on it right now as, as you sit so today? So you listened to the episode I just did with Jack Burgeon yes. yesterday? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, look, what we argue there in that episode, and Jack is advocating for Bitcoin, is, you know, he's saying, all right, well, Bitcoin is going to solve a lot of the inefficiencies in the financial system, right? It's going to be able to get money from point A to point B without fees. Uh, it's going to be efficient. And my argument is, yeah, the digital dollar is going to also be able to do that. And then the question is going to be, well, why would people want Bitcoin instead of the digital dollar other than, you know, what he says, you know, the limited supply, right? He says, all right, well, there's a limited supply of it. So that gives it value. But that really, you know, uh, having a limited supply of something doesn't necessarily give it value. Uh, you know, I have a bunch of shit here in this junk drawer that nobody else would be able to find in the world. You know, I got a coaster here from New Orleans from 1997. You know, it's one of a kind. You know, it's very scarce. Does that mean it's worth something? No, because there needs to be demand for it. So then the question becomes, where does the demand for Bitcoin from come from? It comes from psychological buy in that Bitcoin is going to be a store of value going forward. Right. People think that buying crypto and we'll just talk about Bitcoin. Right. Because that's really that's the head of the snake. People think that Bitcoin will preserve their value uh, going forward, their wealth going forward. So we talked about why printing money is nefarious. Uh, people that advocate for Bitcoin have a lot of great arguments and great criticisms of the monetary system. I agree with a lot of Bitcoin advocates on a lot of things, except for the fact that Bitcoin is the definitive answer. 
uh, you know, personally, I prefer to own gold. It has more of a track record. It's tangible. It has a commodity use in industry. It's used for electronics. It's used in aerospace. It's been used as jewelry for 5,000 years. So gold is something physical. You can touch it. You can hold it. And it has a commodity use and it has a demand. And its price is obviously far less volatile than Bitcoin. And to be a store of value, generally, you want a price that is less volatile. If something goes up by 10% or down by 10% in a day, that means you are either losing or gaining 10% of the wealth that you hoped to store uh, in a very, very short period of time. And that's not indicative usually of a good store of value. Now, people say, oh, it's just volatility. You know, you know you're going to get some of that. It's because of the limited supply and some of it is held elsewhere. And so the market's a liquid and this and that and the other. But the question becomes, you know, will the central banks of the world eventually compete with Bitcoin or will they embrace it? And so right now you have all these banks that are adopting crypto trading. And people think, oh, well, that's adoption of Bitcoin. They're saying that Bitcoin is, uh, you know, that it's going to be here and that it's worth something and that it's, you know, whatever. It's, you know, this piece of mathematical beauty that people think that it is. Um, and I get it. I get the math behind it. And I understand why people think that. And I, you know, I agree that on paper it, it is a piece of mathematical beauty. But in practice, you know, as the days progress, you know, these banks are trading it because they're making fees off of it. You know, they're, they're, you know, and these athletes that take their salary in Bitcoin are doing so because they convert it to dollars when they're done or they're hoping that, you know, many of them have partnerships with crypto partners. Um, and so it's a big thing for them to come out and say they're taking their money in crypto. But in still, until the world is priced in Bitcoin, um, you know, it hasn't really nudged its way in as a mainstream currency. It hasn't been adopted as a mainstream currency. And so until you say, all right, well, this this coffee costs 20 Satoshis or that house costs three Bitcoin or whatever, you know, the dollar has always been the standard, which is why everybody measures the value of their Bitcoin in dollars. Right. So when Bitcoin goes up and I agree that the dollar is losing value and that's why Bitcoin is gaining value. So I, I get that. I agree with that. And in theory, the Bitcoiners beef with the monetary system is legitimate. It's legit. Like, and I've said about Bitcoin before, I think it's the right problem to address, but it might not be the right solution. Um, personally, for me, I think it is far too risky of a solution for me to allocate a lot of money to it. Now, does that, like I said to Jack on my podcast yesterday, does that mean that like, you know, I didn't make money when I could have if I bought it 300 and I sold it 30,000. Yes, that's exactly what it means. But I'm okay with that because I know what my risk profile is. And I think I have my head wrapped around what Bitcoin is. And there is a greater than zero chance that the crypto industry as a whole, which is now a $3 trillion industry, is nothing more than a giant air pocket of nothing. When you turn all the computers off, it's nothing. It doesn't exist, right? Well, Chris, we live in a digital world <laughs> and everything is digital now. You know, that's right. But at the end of the day, what is Bitcoin's utility? In a world where eventually we're going to have digital currencies issued by all the central banks, so th those will be here in probably five or 10 years, right? In that world, what is Bitcoin's utility? What is it? It's, a, it's an unregulated asset that makes transferring money easier. It allows you to kind of end around traditional banking, which is fantastic, but you know that that's not going to be legal forever. It's going to be regulated by FinCEN. It's going to be regulated by the SEC. So what is the purpose of it going to be? Is it going to be this you know, digital gold? Do people think that it's going to be a digital you know, gold in a vault that if you are... If you're this person that has your name on the blockchain here and your name on the ledger that you are, you know, ascribing, uh, you know, yourself to this uh, ledger that is going to act as the immutable uh, determination of who owns value and wealth going forward. I mean, you think that the Bitcoin, you know, ledger is going to be the the Ten Commandments of where value lies in you know throughout the course of human history i don't know it's only been 10 years it's got a very short track record so to to bank on that and say look i'm putting my name on this guest list to get into a club that may not even exist 
doesn't make a lot of sense to me, you know, so I'm I'm skeptical of it. And, you know, a lot of people give me shit about it and that's fine. But there's a real case that because crypto is becoming so intertwined into the financial system that it could become systemic if something happens to crypto. Isn't you know, China crypto- developing their own central uh, digital bank? What's that? Isn't China developing their own digital central bank? And wouldn't yeah. other other? Yeah, and I, I guess- think they're going to back it with gold. That was one of the first right. articles I wrote um, on my blog about. Uh, basically, it was called uh, "China Will Back the Digital Yuan with Gold." Um, you know, China banned crypto in their country. People say, "Oh, it's because they don't like the energy usage." You know, China's having an energy crisis. I think it could be because they might see themselves as sidestepping a global economic cataclysm in the future. Um, and so for me, there's a lot of things I can't really get around. If you want to be a safe haven, you want to be the the store of value, the foundation that uh, sits underneath all of the risk assets that's there when everything else implodes, which is essentially what people say Bitcoin is. They say it's going to be the, the truth, the end all be all. I am the light. I am the way, whatever. Right. Uh, that's what they think it's going to be. And you can't access it when the power goes out or your internet access goes out. Well, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. You know, if I want to, if I want, you know, you, my apocalyptic Armageddon style hedge against the whole fucking system going up, you know, for me, that's gold. People say, oh, what are you going to do? Lug your gold around with you? Most people have no clue. You could fit probably 10 times your net worth in gold in half of a shoebox if you needed to. I mean, there's nothing. So if we go back to primitive times, if an asteroid hits the Earth or a solar flare shuts down the grid or an EMP attack happens or any of these crazy, you know, end of the world scenarios that Bitcoiners like to talk about, you know, I'd rather have the gold than the Bitcoin. Does that mean I'm right? No. You know, look, I've been wrong about a lot of shit in the past and I'm going to be wrong about shit going forward. I've just examined Bitcoin uh, I think a bit. And to me, I'm just not sold. I'm not sold. There's always an argument that I feel like I can poke a hole in when it comes to Bitcoin. And to me, to arrive at something that, you know, I want to get behind 110 percent, I don't want there to be a shred of doubt about it. And with Bitcoin, I have more than one shred of doubt about it. In your thoughts, not to say that I'm going to be right. Is, uh, is in your thoughts, is crypto a, a commodity, a currency or a security? Uh. I don't really know. I mean, I guess I guess it's a security. I mean, it's it looks like Gary Gensler is going to define it as a security. It's a brand new asset class. You know, it's been around for like, what, 10 years, barely. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I don't really know. I mean, it's it, to me, it's not it's not much different than, you know, uh, opening an Excel document on my computer and, you know, writing down in in rows one through 50 who i think the 50 most influential people in the united states are and then proclaiming that that is going to be the end all be all of you know who uh, who's going to hold the most gravitas uh on planet earth going forward it's nothing it's a digital nothing it's a digital ledger of nothing and that's you know that's really what bitcoin is it's it's a digital ledger that you hold nothing you know you hold a spot I always say a spot on a guest list to a club that doesn't exist. In the metaverse. God <laughs> yeah. damn. There's no DJ. There's no fucking bottle service. There's no hot waitresses. None of your friends are there. It's just a spreadsheet. You're just on the it's guest just a list. Spreadsheet. You have goggles on in your back of your room. That's it. Yeah. So, I, you know, I don't know. But, hey, man, people are buying digital art for $50 million. Yeah, no so shit. Know, you know what I mean? Like, look at me. I live in a... 400 square foot studio okay like i'm obviously not predicting everything <laughs> perfectly quote the raven.substack.com that's it and uh the blog one more time fringe what is it called fringe finance okay i'm writing that I down i named it that because somebody tried to insult me by calling me fringe finance they're, they're like oh, i don't listen to this guy he's fringe finance oh that's like, great yeah, watch this shit I'm that's how you that, fucking blog that. that that's why we named this show red pill tamales because people are like oh what are you trying to do put red pills in tamales now and it's like actually that's yes. exactly what yeah. we're doing open up motherfucker <laughs> hell yeah man <laughs> have fun tonight at the genesis concert uh thank if, you guys if you get an autograph from uh phil let them know uh that i need one too for show okay and uh, be safe out is there. He, is he familiar with Chingo Bling? Will he know you right away if I bring up your name? Man, you know what? These days you never know, brother. You never know. <laughs> you never know. 
So thank you so much, man. Great to catch up again. Uh, Chris you guys Irons, are awesome. Chris Irons, Quote the Raven podcast, Quote the Raven dot Substack, and Fringe Finance blog. Yeah, next time we'll have to do this in the evening uh, on a live stream so we can do some super chats and with a couple of beers. I feel like that will be even more yeah. off the charts. Well, I got a bottle of brandy right here for those such events. Fantastic. So dude. We'll schedule would, it in 2022. And Chingo, you should come on my podcast too, man. Oh, yeah, I'd love to, man. We could talk jujitsu, whatever you want to talk. Oh, about. you got your oh, key back you on. Yeah, he just got it back the other day. You put I, it back on. I took a class, man. I went to Did a you? class. Yeah, I went to a class. I'll be back next He's week. He's being modest. I had people DMing me like, oh, shit, Chingo's back on the, on the mats. I was like, yeah, he is. People back, were excited. Back on the mat, baby. He, he had That's that furious, he, was, he had that serious face too. And he was, I you gotta, know, I got to show my, uh, I'm wearing my Puzan jujitsu shirt my buddy drew Puzan, milltown new jersey high yeah, quality yeah. individual represent crazy motherfucker but i love him badass man well i hope you have a great new year and we'll talk to you in 2022 dude all right you guys are awesome talk to you later thank Take you care. peace